Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this webinar co-sponsored by the Center for the United States and Mexico at Rice University, Baker Institute, and Signos Vitales. My name is Rodrigo Montesioca, and I am a research scholar at the Center for the United States and Mexico. Yesterday, President Biden was sworn in as the 46th President of the United States. With this, a new chapter began in the US-Mexico relationship history. The incoming Biden administration and President López Obrador's government will face enormous challenges if they want to restore North America as a region. In terms of diplomacy, there will be new ambassadors in Washington, D.C. and Mexico City. Regarding trade, the USMCA implementation and execution could raise big legal disputes between countries, especially in the energy and labor sectors. In security cooperation, the US agents deployed in Mexico will face a new framework issued by Mexican Congress that regulates their actions on Mexican soil. Talking about migration, a new Central American caravan is heading to the United States. This will show if agreements made during the Trump administration, such as the Remain in Mexico program, will prevail during the Biden's administration. And finally, a global pandemic that is killing thousands of people daily and destroying the country's economies. To discuss these timely topics and more, we are delighted to have a great panel of experts. I will introduce all of them. Our first speaker will be Ambassador Arturo Sarucan. Ambassador Sarucan is the founder and president of Sarucan Associates and former Mexican ambassador to the US. He writes a bi-weekly column in El Universal, one of the most important newspapers in Mexico, and frequently publishes op-eds in US media outlets. He holds a master's degree in American foreign policy from John Hopkins School and a bachelor's degree in international relations from El Colegio de Mexico. Without any doubt, I can say that Ambassador Sarucan is one of the most qualified voices to speak and tweet about the US-Mexico relationship. Our second speaker will be Banda Felbat Brown. Banda is an expert on international organized crime. She's a senior fellow in the Center for Security, Strategy and Technology in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings. Dr. Felbat Brown is the author of a forthcoming book titled Narco Noir, Mexico's Cartels, Cops and Corruption. She has a PhD in political science from MIT and a bachelor's in government from Harvard University. Her recent, publications about, her recent publications about what to expect in terms of US-Mexico security cooperation are a great source to understand the challenges and opportunities for both countries on this topic. Our third speaker will be Enrique Cardenas. Enrique is the chairman of Signos Vitales, a Mexican NGO that produces quarterly reports with expert data analysis in a, in a wide range of topics, such as economy, trade, security, and health. Its last report is about what to expect of the US-Mexico relationship under President Biden's administration. Enrique was the president of the Universidad de las Americas Puebla for many years and the co-founder of Centro, of Centro de Estudios Espinosa Iglesias. He holds a PhD in economics from Yale University and a bachelor's in economics from the ITAM Mexico. Our last speaker will be Tony Payan. Tony is the Francois and Edward de Regent Fellow for Mexico Studies and Director of the Center of the United States and Mexico. He's also a social science professor at the Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juárez, Chihuahua. His research focuses on border studies, particularly the US-Mexico border. Tony holds a PhD in international relations from Georgetown University and a bachelor's in philosophy and classical languages from the University of Dallas. The dynamic of the session is the following. Each panelist will speak for up to 10 minutes and then all of us will join to participate in the Q&A session. If you have any question for our panelists, please submit them using the Q&A button that appears in the bottom of your screen. Without further, it is a privilege to pass the microphone to Ambassador Sarukan. Ambassador Sarukan, welcome to the Baker Institute. The, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Rodrigo and Tony and Enrique. Thank you for the 
invitation to join you here today. Um, it's a great pleasure to be also with my esteemed colleague Vanda Felba Brown from Brookings. Um, and and this, this panel um, could not come at a more timely moment, uh, not only because of a new administration in Washington, but because of what we've seen and witnessed um, and experienced these last uh, four years in the US-Mexico bilateral relationship. Um, I, when, when I teach, I teach a post-grad seminar on US-Mexican uh, contemporary issues um, here in Washington. And what I usually uh, tell my students is that uh, we need to remember that there had been originally one nadir, a low point, in the US-Mexico relationship in modern history, which was in the 1980s. And to remind my students of why uh, US-Mexico relations reached a low point in the 1980s, and it was driven by a completely external affair uh, to uh, an external issue, uh, not directly related to US-Mexico relations, which was how Mexican and US foreign policies clashed over Central America and the issues of democracy, uh, 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 peace, and, 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 uh, uh, and dictatorship. Uh, but then in the midst of that fight, um, the uh, arrest, uh, the sorry, the abduction, torture, and assassination of a DEA agent, Enrique Camarena, in 1985. And these two events completely scuttled the US-Mexico bilateral relationship and started a dynamic which uh, 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 changed dramatically later on because of NAFTA first and then the impact and effects of 9-11 on intelligence sharing bilateral security cooperation. And, and, and that we hadn't seen a moment as bad as that one until Donald Trump came to the presidency of the United States in 2016, you all know, uh, he has he used Mexico as a, a political electoral piñata, and both the previous Mexican government and this Mexican government uh, decided to try and find some sort of accommodation. Uh, I would say in some areas like Mexico's immigration policy to disastrous effects. Um, but but uh, the, the question now with, with the new administration is, what's going to happen and how, how is this relationship going to going to move forward and is a reset in the relationship possible and as in most things in life um you, you know the saying you need to detangle in the case of us mexico relations salsa isn't mexican danzon is but you need to to to, to dance the danzon and and the question here is whether the mexican administration is willing to engage and build, rebuild a synergistic, forward-looking um, strategic relationship with the United States. And I, I, have, I have some serious doubts in that regard. Um, obviously, uh, a lot of it has to do with this very unique relationship that uh, President Andres Manuel López Obrador struck with his American counterpart over the past two years. But the challenge that I think we need to understand is that what could have been explained in Washington as pragmatism in uh, the Mexican president's approach to relations with Trump, particularly as a result of this last summer, when he ill-advisedly came up to Washington during the general campaign, when he said what he said at the Rose Garden, which was used politically and electorally by the Trump campaign to mobilize Latino and particularly Mexican-American votes uh, uh, to, to, I think, an important effect, particularly in the Rio Grande Valley uh, of Texas, when he then decided to with, withhold his congratulations to President-elect Biden until after the Electoral College had deposited its votes, his um, very bewildering letter of congratulations, which contrasts uh, profoundly with the four page um, letter that he sent to uh, Trump after López Obrador's political victory in 2018. Uh, then his decision to uh, uh, extend the offer of political asylum to Julian Assange, the man that single handedly hacked the Democratic campaign in 2016. 
um, the uh, uh, the impact of the law uh, of the bill to reform bank, the, the central bank, the new regs on uh, how to engage and collaborate and cooperate with US agencies, the way the Mexican government uh, has played its cards by revealing documents uh, 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 regarding the Cienfuego case, the Cienfuegos case. Um, all of this uh, is, is now much harder to explain up here in Washington, D.C. as mere pragmatism. And so having said all of this, um, I, I, I am convinced that, that Joe Biden, who knows the relationship extremely well, who knows Mexico well, I always say that Biden has been present at the creation of every single pivotal moment in the modernization of US-Mexico ties. Uh, since the days of, of NAFTA, the financial rescue package in 1994, the elimination of the drug cert of the unilateral drug certification process, uh, which Mexico suffered every March of every year, um, his role in, in building up the edifice of national security intelligence and law enforcement collaboration after 9-11 with the Medi Initiative, his role as vice president in uh, engaging uh, with uh, those first moments of Central American transmigration through Mexico. Uh, this, is, this is a guy, uh, the, 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 the transition from one party rule in Mexico to multi-party rule in 2000. Joe Biden has been there and seen it all and has been engaged in, in, in the bilateral relationship as probably no other US living or active politician in the United States today is. So he knows the relationship extremely well. I don't think he uh, uh, walked into the Oval Office yesterday carrying a grudge. He will seek to very quickly send signals of re-engagement with Mexico, of returning to some level of normalcy in the relationship, uh, of the role that the different agencies and interagency processes play in the relationship. But we have to say this, that there is a degree of anger, of bewilderment in key members of his team and now of his cabinet and sub-cabinet. There is bewilderment on Capitol Hill with the Democratic Party, both in the Senate and in the House, as to how Mexico has engaged with the Biden administration. And at the end of the day, there, there is a question which one must ask, which is whether López Obrador, either because of his own take on the Democratic Party and what he probably feels is the lack of support of Democrats to his failed bids in 2006 and 2012, um, his peculiar view and his peculiar take on foreign policy, on international affairs and international relations, um, as to whether he is purposefully trying to create points of contention and points of conflict with the incoming US administration to either be able to deflect potential criticism, what will likely be a US administration, unlike the previous US administration that just cared about immigration and uh, issues on the border, a US administration that will be either in public or in private, talking about issues of democracy, of checks and balances in Mexico, of a level of playing field for businesses, of climate change in the environment, of renewable energies, of democracy, um, whether the president is seeking to very quickly draw red lines uh, on the floor, draw, draw a line in the sand to be able to ensure that what he sees as uh, interference in the domestic political affairs of Mexico does not occur with a new Biden administration, and whether he's also thinking of sort of engaging in what has been or had been a persistent facet of Mexican domestic politics until NAFTA and 9-11 changed the dynamics of the bilateral relationship of using the relationship with the United States as a domestic polit political distractor uh, when economic or political issues in Mexico don't go well. So there are a lot of question marks. I, I do think that the Biden administration, particularly on the issue of immigration, will try to uh, very quickly create a narrative of collaboration, of engagement, of discarding the my way or the highway approach of Donald Trump towards 
the relationship with Mexico, of the imposition of unilateral policies that Trump foisted on Mexico these past two years. Um, but at the same time, the relationship, let's be clear, is probably not going to be peachy and rosy. There will be issues of, of, of tension, of contention. And um, I think that we all need to, to do our best to ensure that uh, one of the best presidents to reach the White House in terms of his understanding and engagement with Mexico, even though the bandwidth, the foreign policy bandwidth in, 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 in Washington, in the White House, does not mean that the President Biden will be thinking of Mexico and US-Mexican bilateral affairs on, uh, on a 24 seven basis. We have a president in Washington, a US president, who understands the relationship, who if Lopez Obrador is willing, can deliver on things that for Lopez Obrador were important during his campaign, when he talked about everything from a Marshall Plan in attacking the structural causes of, of Central American transmigration through Mexico, and a much more constructive, mature um, relationship that, again, focuses on this key paradigm that we developed uh, in the past uh, two decades of joint responsibility as the central tenet of how Mexico and the United States engage on a host of very complex, very fluid issues in the US-Mexico bilateral relationship. Well, um, thank you very much, Rodrigo, for um, inviting me to the conversation. And um, it's uh, always wonderful to be on a panel with Ambassador Sarukan, um, as well as with Dr. Uh, Cardenas and Dr. Payan. So I'm looking forward uh, to our conversation. Um, Rodrigo, when you uh, gave the introduction, you spoke about a new framework um, by which uh, US law enforcement officials uh, can or must now operate in Mexico. I would say that there is potentially a larger new framework uh, echoing what Ambassador Sarukan said. Much of the Trump uh, uh, Lopez Obrador administration's exchanges centered essentially on the following bargain. Then in exchange for a negotiating NAFTA, what has become USMCA, and essentially other compliance or even acceptance of what uh, the Trump administration foisted on Mexico, very apt choice of word there by Ambassador Sarukan, in terms of migration, the Trump administration would um, disengage from a whole variety of issues about which it cares, about which the United States normally cares very deeply. So there was this bargain that as long as there was compliance on very brutal uh, anti-immigration policies from the Mexican side, the United States would, uh, at least not publicly, but even um, uh, in private, uh, be not uh, paying attention to issues of clean energy, uh, reversals of um, uh, energy reforms, US uh, uh, contracts, um, environmental destruction, such as related to the Mayan train, and also on security. Even though there was engagement on security, uh, that level at the White House, uh, that issue at the White House level anyway, would be subordinated to migration. And in my view, this uh, principle bargain uh, is no longer going to hold. And um, in fact, those set those issues, energy, migration, um, US contracts, labor laws, uh, and security will in fact provide uh, very significant challenges uh, for the bilateral relationship. I will speak about the security dimensions in particular. And um, I was again struck by Ambassador Sanukan reference to the uh, mid 1980s and the context of why the US-Mexican relationship was so low at that point. On the one hand, engagement in Central America and on the other, the uh, murder of um, a Drug Enforcement Administration agent uh, Camarena with complicity of high uh, Mexican officials. Uh, I see the um, security relationship to be at its lowest point since then, not as um, devastatingly low as when uh, agent Camarena was uh, murdered, uh, but certainly the lowest point since uh, that period. And much of that has uh, been thrust to uh, the prime view uh, since October when uh, the Department of Justice arrested uh, General Cienfuegos. 
but it proceeds uh, in some ways with much less visibility uh, that moment, even though the set of actions that have been taking place since October, since that arrest, uh, uh, and that are playing out still on a daily basis, even as late as um, yesterday, um, uh, pre uh, create a context of very difficult uh, security moment. One where I think many in the United States uh, question whether there is in fact a co security cooperation left or whether uh, Mexico now treats the United States in terms of uh, security cooperation, the way that uh, not the neighbor, not the partner, uh, but at best a neutral or even an antagonistic country would be uh, treating the United States. I'll come to those issues in a moment, but want to a little bit reflect on um, uh, the, the larger framework. There might perhaps be hope in uh, the Mexican government that uh, the Biden administration will delink issues that it will separate what has happened in the uh, uh, security relationship and frankly the way the Lopez Obrador administrations since October blew up, outright sabotaged uh, the security relationship and put it aside and be um, simply satisfied with cooperating on um, economic revival in both countries after COVID and on uh, the migration issue. But I think that even though the Biden administration clearly wants to focus on uh, migration, it's already started doing so yesterday and uh, President Biden was uh, the author of the Alliance for Prosperity uh, package um, uh, of development uh, in Central America when he was vice president, even that dimension is not going to be easy particularly because uh, the, the key elements of uh, the uh, Alliance for Prosperity and the development package in Central America focused on rule of law, focused on fighting political corruption, as well as uh, organized crime infiltration and corruption. And what has happened uh, is in the Cienfuegos um, handling on the Mexican government, uh, I think um, raises fundamental questions whether there is in fact any willingness in Mexico to tackle infiltration of organized crime groups um, into uh, institutions uh, in Central America, uh, but I would say also in Mexico. So what has happened in that security uh, relationship? Uh, very quickly, after uh, 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 former Minister of Defense Cien Fuegos was arrested in the United States, the Mexican government put, uh, all, uh, put all, all tools on the table to get uh, uh, General Cienfuegos released. In fact, uh, supposedly did so by even threatening to deny access to US law enforcement agent. The Department of Justice to prevent that uh, from developing, uh, from, from happening, uh, dropped the charges against Cienfuegos and released him to Mexico. Now, let me emphasize that this is truly extraordinary. The Department of Justice is not in the habit of uh, dropping charges um, uh, against very high indicted uh, officials or people suspected of very um, fundamental roles in uh, organized crime on the basis of pressure from outside. So the fact that the Justice Department agreed to this was real break in decades of the department's uh, approaches and behavior, and frankly, huge break in how the United States conducts its rule of law and law enforcement abroad. But nonetheless, the judgment was made that uh, preserving uh, the access of US enforcement agents and their ability to collaborate and assist Mexican uh, officials in investigations against organized crime and in stopping the flows of drugs such as fentanyl to the United States was worth that, that extraordinary decision, that extraordinary break in US policies. But unfortunately, uh, the government of Mexico did not seize uh, that opportunity and instead escalated the relationship and resorted to measures that from the US side uh, can really be seen as deceptive of the basic bargain that was achieved, namely the foreign agent law uh, that was uh, subsequently passed with a strong approval and, um, and support uh, from President Lopez Obrador jeopardized the access of uh, US law enforcement agents 
uh, despite the essential bargain. The, the restrictions that were put on how US law enforcement agents and frankly any agent, any official can interact with uh, their Mexican counterparts for all practical purposes, gutted the, any meaningful operations and meaningful cooperation as they exist. So that was terrible um, from the perspective of security in both countries. Um, of security in Mexico, where 2020 will have likely turned out to be yet another record-breaking year with homicides, where we have seen egregious forms of violence uh, taking place with utter brazenness of um, criminal groups that were not weakened, but in fact strongly strengthened uh, by COVID. Uh, there was a little bit of an adjustment uh, as a result of dialogue. Uh, some of the, some of the uh, recently published uh, uh, practical guidelines for how the law is to be implemented backpedal from some of the most um, uh, devastating uh, and paralyzing elements uh, of the law. But nonetheless, the, the relationship is still much weakened and the cooperation collaboration, including US ability to provide intelligence to Mexico is much weakened. But we have seen since then a whole set of other um, a really terrible decision on the part of the Mexican government that is including um, unilateral releasing uh, the, um, the, the file that the Department of Justice handed over to Mexico on General Cienfuegos without telling the US government, without clearing what was sensitive information and could jeopardize sources or methods um, and being in violation of the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty. All of those really, in my view, put the security relationship in a deep freeze uh, that, that goes back to uh, the 1990s. Uh, digging that relationship out of that deep freeze will be challenging. And I would also emphasize though, that the slides toward the deep freeze, the buildup uh, to uh, what happened in October long precedes that including very significant weakening of interest on the part of the Lopez Obrador administration to cooperate uh, with the United States on security issues, um, uh, real unwillingness to talk about how to adapt Mer uh, Merida, the Merida initiative, the, the basic uh, structure of the US security cooperation uh, now with sort of hopes that all the US would do would be to channel its funding toward uh, treatment uh, of uh, those with substance abuse disorder only, nothing that has happened, uh, nothing that US will do. Um, uh, close to no interest on the part of uh, the Lopez Obrador administration to cooperate even on simple politically non-controversial issues such as uh, stopping fentanyl flows through um, US ports, stopping the production of fentanyl in Mexico, uh, killing tens of thousands of Americans uh, yearly, but uh, posing a major public uh, self safety public health threat in Mexico uh, also. So again, I see us in a real deep freeze, really low and difficult uh, moment in the security relationship uh, that will take um, a significant amount of effort uh, to recover from, and that might not easily be delinked from other issues uh, in the relationship. Thank you, and I look uh, forward to uh, Enrique's comments. Oh. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this panel and to Signos Vitales and the Baker Institute to, to be able to, to host this. Um, it's, it's great to, to be along with Ambassador Arturo Sarucan, uh, uh, Vanda Felbad, and uh, Tony, Tony Payan. Uh, I would like to, to say, uh, to start by saying that the Biden administration is most welcomed by Mex most Mexicans. Uh, really, 2020 uncovered the huge limitations of the Lopez Obrador and Trump administrations to manage issues like the economy, security, migration, or the pandemic. The policy followed by Trump with Mexico was very limited in scope, as, as has been said, and uh, we see that that would change. Mexico is not really prepared to face that, I have to say. There has been a, an institutional dismantling of uh, certain capabilities that Mexico had, not, not only in terms of um, segments of the government, but also in terms of uh, people who are no longer in the, in the government. Um, the NAFTA's replacement by the USMCA really stands out as the 
basically the only positive uh, event that we have had in the in the near past. Uh, and in spite that the new treaty poses several challenges to Mexico, in addition to what was there under NAFTA, uh, for instance, in terms of labor relations, in terms of the rules of origin and so on, uh, it, it has to, uh, I have to say that it is a blessing that at the time when the Mexican government is heading towards an absurd and energy and environmental policy. And let me go into those two fields uh, to complement what uh, my colleagues have uh, mentioned so far on, on, on the economy. Um, given the response by Lopez Obrador to the pandemic, it is very probable that foreign trade will end up as being the only source of growth for, for Mexico in the, next, uh, in the next years. There's really no strong source of domestic growth uh, that we can envision. There has been really a decline in uh, investment, both domestic and international investment in the country. So that we can foresee that in the next uh, few years, uh, GDP will just barely recover part of the growth, uh, you know, of the of the level that we had before. It is expected that uh, we will uh, reach the 2018 uh, per capita income level until 2025 or even 2026. So that's that's you know, it, it's almost a decade that we are going to lose in that regard. So um, now, depending on Biden's approach to China which I suppose is going to change, but I, I, don't, I couldn't say more about that. But what, what we saw is that Mexico could have an opportunity there to substitute China in certain uh, uh, exports that they, they sent to the US uh, as, as happened in the past. Uh, but that's, that's about it in, in that relationship. So, but in terms of the compliance of the USMCA uh, treaty, uh, there will be much more strain in both relations as, as, as has already been mentioned. The other field, which is very important, I think, and it's a blessing that uh, for, for Mexico and maybe not for the government, is that um, there will be, a, 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 I think the, people, uh, the US government is not, look, is not going to look the other way in terms of climate change and environment policy that we are following in this, in this country. Uh, Lopez Obrador's government has approved and ratified projects that do not comply with the norms for environmental protection, the care of protected natural areas, or the impact that they can have both for human health and climate change. Um, uh, we have deliberately lost a lot of information, official information. This is very important. That's why Singles Vitalis was created actually. Because uh, for instance, in the, in the environmental field, we have lost about 86% of the indicators that we had on the environment, of in, uh, information that was uh, produced by the government as, um, you know, in, in the environment and climate change. We have lost that. So we are really in the shadow in, in that regard, but we know by, um, by uh, the production of uh, electricity from fossil oil, uh, fossils, uh, fuels, uh, that is creating tremendous um, impact in the environment. So pressure from the Biden administration on climate change and environment, as well as from European Union, uh, the, the European Union and other countries uh, will be beneficial for Mexico and a potential source of conflict with the Mexican government if it insists uh, on its current environmental policy. So we are expecting a clash there, uh, especially because those are the sectors which are uh, quite close to uh, Lopez Obrador's um, idea of, of development. And certainly the other one is energy. Uh, the Lopez Obrador government has in effect reversed the energy reform uh, that was passed in uh, 2013, uh, which opened the Mexican energy sector. Really it has reversed it in fact. They have not changed, they have not changed the constitution. They have not changed uh, major laws, but they have administratively in fact, reversed it, and that um, it's it's uh, has already been you know creating problems um, uh, with domestic and foreign companies, and uh, uh, for instance, the generation of electricity, um, as I was mentioning, with the, the use of ex exhaustive use of fossil fuels uh, for health and environmental consequences is one. But then the violation of the current legal framework on energy is already a litigious issue. Uh, we already have a lot of uh, lit uh, litigation there and the promises to continue to be so. 
So we expect to have many more legal disputes in the near future, um, and that perhaps can help um, restrain the Mexican government from going into that direction towards, you know, um, completely opposite to, to, to the policy that should be following uh, for climate change and so on. So uh, in that sense, the coming of Biden in the US government is a blessing for Mexicans, but maybe a headache for, for the Mexican government. And finally, I have just to mention that in June, we have national midterm elections. This is the chance that we have as Mexican people and, and we want to follow the, the, the US example that uh, uh, it's a chance uh, to contain the institutional destruction that we have suffered so far. If that happens, uh, the, legis the legislative could restrict the excesses that this government has had so far, especially uh, governing above the law. It has, uh, you know, governed above the law, reaching dangerously to the military. This is quite important as well. And the issue on uh, the release of uh, um, former Secretary uh, Cienfuegos that uh, Vanda was mentioning about is, is an example, an additional example of all this. Uh, but it's not only that, uh, the Lopez Obrador um, government has given them many more um, uh, attributes, uh, functions, uh, even the managing of the new airport that they are constructing and so on. So it, it is quite dangerous, uh, this approach that they have had with the military, I think. And finally, attacking civil society organizations and the fairly autonomous electoral system. This, in my view, is... Um, is, is uh, you know it's really bombing some of the major um, um, sources of uh, legitimacy and democracy in the country, and that is also quite quite dangerous. So we expect that these new elections, the, the next elections, uh, can have a result can have the result of restraining, maybe not going the other way, but at least restraining what we have seen in the past. So thank you very much, and le let me uh, pass on to Tony. Now, thank you very much. Thank you, Enrique. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here with Ambassador Sarokan. We last met uh, at the Starbucks on Dupont Circle. Uh, we had a, a good conversation. The book, Ambassador, is finally coming out. Uh, you're uh, cited in it. Uh, uh, and of course, it's a pleasure to talk to, uh, to Vanda again, and uh, of course, to welcome Enrique, who is actually a co-organizer of this panel. Uh, so let me... Uh, 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 use my uh, few minutes uh, to agree with my colleagues essentially on the uh, difficulties uh, that are ahead in the binational relationship. The very first thing that I want to say is that the binational relationship, the tone, uh, the accomplishments of the binational relationship under the uh, Biden Lopez Obrador pair of leaders in these two countries will depend almost entirely on Mexico. It'll be Mexico, uh, 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 the partner that has to make a number of important corrections uh, for the relationship to work. I do agree that there's many different issues here uh, and there's likely to be many different fires on issues as diverse as uh, trade, as immigration, as the uh, joint uh, border, as and certainly energy and security as Vanda mentioned. Uh, but I think that let's, I think we have to dig a little deeper and figure out exactly where the uh, potential for, for a, a, a degree of overlap, uh, a, a coincidence in interest is. I think the framework will be defined by a number of elements that may tell us a little bit where we're going in the next uh, uh, four years uh, I, I guess towards the end of the Biden administration, but also the end of the Lopez Obrador administration, or at least we hope uh, that he will uh, 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 pass on the baton uh, when the time comes in 2024. Uh, the very first thing is the philosophy. I think the one thing that uh, made uh, the Trump administration and the Lopez Obrador administration relatively compatible is the fact that they're both uh, characterized by uh, certain populist inclinations and by a certain degree of autocracy. They're both in many, many ways autocrats. Uh, and I think those are the words that define them. It's a style of politics. I mean, if we look at the different, uh, uh, at the political behaviors of these uh, individuals, 
Now, there are attacks on the free press, there are attacks on the rule of law, on uh, institutions, on the opposition, uh, conceiving them as enemies, not just as political rivals. Uh, there are uh, polarizing rhetoric in uh, both societies. Uh, the, the, the vision of the, um, of, of the various segments of society attacking some and endorsing others, um, uh, and on and on. We can see many different coincidences. And uh, I don't think it's surprising that Lopez Obrador and uh, Trump uh, managed to achieve a degree of understanding between them because their style of uh, governing and their style of doing politics, their style of relating to their respective societies and the different uh, components of their societies were very similar. So in, them, in that sense, I think they, they managed some sort of uh, understanding between them. In addition to that, of course, they're both highly nationalistic. The Make America First uh, 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 was uh, the quintessential uh, nationalistic stand by the Trump administration. And of course, Lopez Obrador is a nationalist, but it's, a, it's kind of an old nationalism. It's that kind of nationalism that was po probably uh, 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 conceived in the time of the uh, uh, PRI, which he was a member of back in his youth. Um, it, it, they're both anti-globalist. They're both in many ways uh, reacting uh, to the uh, uh, globalization processes that occurred in the last uh, uh, two and a half decades before uh, they took office. Uh, and so clearly they're reactionaries in their own right and their conception of their own countries uh, are certainly much more nationalistic uh, at a time when we require increased uh, international cooperation by many, many different actors, governmental and non-governmental, for global governance of the kinds of issues that we're facing today, a pandemic uh, and economic crisis that is global in scope, uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, climate change and such. Uh, so they're uh, going in one direction, whereas the problems and the, the kinds of frameworks that are required to solve those problems are going in the opposite direction. So there has to be a change in philosophy, in understanding the Weltanschauung that Mr. Lopez Obrador bases his understanding of public policy and governing and on and on has to change. And so much of what happens in the binational relationship, I think, will depend on him. Uh, the other thing is uh, common interests. Of course, these countries have uh, common interests, but interests are also defined. Uh, so uh, Mr. Uh, Lopez Obrador, for example, doesn't define a modern, high-tech, open energy sector in the interest of Mexico. So he's redefining the interest. So there has to be a conscious effort to redefine the interests of both countries and then find that intersection, that overlap in interests. And I think that that overlap, that intersection in the definition of interest depends very much on how Biden defines the interests of the United States and how uh, uh, Lopez Obrador defines the interests of Mexico. And I, I think that very often we make the mistake of thinking that interests are fixed. The reality is that interests are defined and the overlap in interests and therefore the ability to cooperate depends on the definitions employed and where you locate the definitions on the graph and how much of an overlap there is. We've seen, for example, that with the, uh, uh, with the um, uh, NAFTA and now USMCA, there was some overlap in interests, but clearly they spoke to different conceptions of interests for each country. And so a lot of it will depend on how the Lopez Obrador administration moves, because clearly Biden is redefining the interests of the United States as more internationalist, based on diversity, based on cooperation, based on inclusion. And those are not necessarily less nationalism, I think not less patriotism, less nationalism. And I think that is where the, uh, the, that intersection, uh, the overlap among interests may uh, become uh, considerably uh, smaller and, and therefore the ability to reach agreements on how to pursue those interests jointly, how to cooperate on those interests uh, may actually become uh, reduced. Uh, the other uh, element that I think is important to watch over the next four years is going to be the teams. Uh, the Biden administration has already put 
uh, his team in place. Uh, uh, we see uh, uh, Alejandro Mallorcas at DHS. There's going to be a lot of uh, security issues uh, that pertain to DHS, of course, also the Justice Department. Uh, and they're going to have a new attitude towards crime and towards uh, 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 homeland threats. Uh, Mexico has much to do with that on immigration, on the border, uh, on cooperation against uh, other international forces that may uh, target the United States and so on. So Mexico will have to figure out how it's going to work with DHS and somebody like Alejandro Mayorkas that we cannot forget is Cuban. And the Cuban American community has a very different conception of Hispanics and a very different attitude towards policy and towards the country than say Mexican Americans or Puerto Rican Americans and so on. Uh, and then of course we have Juan Gonzalez also uh, in charge of Latin American affairs at the National Security Council. That is also very important because he's Colombian. And so that may suggest that the grounds for cooperation will be based largely on the Colombian model. Uh, we're not sure, obviously he comes from a, a a previous relationship with Biden, but clearly uh, uh, Colombia has been one country that has allowed the United States to cooperate actively in fighting organized crime and the guerrillas and on. Uh, I, I would say rather successfully, not perfectly, but successfully. And so I wonder if that is where Gonzalez might push uh, things in the future. And of course, Roberta Jacobson is the new uh, quote unquote border czar in charge of uh, border affairs. And of course, Roberta comes from the embassy in Mexico City, very smart, very knowledgeable of uh, Mexico, very knowledgeable of the dynamics in the binational relationship, and she's likely to push uh, US interests on the border. There is an incredible opportunity for the border in the hands of Roberta Jacobson, but that's the team. On the other side, uh, Ambassador Marta Barcena is leaving Washington, and in her stead, we see Moctezuma, an old style pre-politician that was now designated by, uh, by the Lopez Obrador administration, perhaps more nationalistic, more defensive in his style. We'll see. We don't know yet how he's going to behave, but he's going to lead the team. And I think one of the major problems that Lopez Obrador has in his team, in his administration, is that he, like Trump, values loyalty over competence. So much uh, of the uh, team that supports the Lopez Obrador administration agenda in Mexico is actually quite incompetent, whether it's in energy, whether it's in trade, whether it's on the border, whether it's on the binational relationship, on diplomacy, and so on. There are a few people perhaps that show promise that can learn quickly, and there are probably much, much better. I think uh, the foreign ministry, Marcelo Ebrard, is actually uh, uh, the right person for the job given the circumstances, but I think there is a uh, a value of loyalty over competence. And I think that Lopez Obrador does not appear to have the team to handle the many, many different issues that will be, uh, uh, I, I think, on the table in the binational relationship. So in many, way, many ways, I think it'll depend on the Lopez Obrador administration. He has to fulfill three different things. Number one, there has to be a change in his philosophy in the way he conceives Mexico's problems. There has to be a higher degree of competence in the team, and there has to be a shift in the way he conceives interests, Mexico's interests, to find greater overlap between the two countries. Uh, so I think, unfortunately, uh, uh, I don't see that the Lopez Obrador administration and himself are very flexible. They may not move very easily to accommodate all these three changes that will be required for a more productive relationship. But that's, that's where we are. And so I think much of it will depend on Mexico. Final comments, if I may. Uh, Mexico is wasting an incredible opportunity. Uh, clearly, the Lopez Obrador administration carries a certain ideological baggage with it. We see it within his political party. There are two wings a wing that is very much allied with the old communism. They were trained in that school. They're aligned with the Forum of Sao Paulo. They're, they like Cuba and Venezuela and, of course, Evo Morales. And they're sort of radical in that sense. And then there's a, a more moderate wing. And so which of these two wings within Morena will prevail over Mr. Lopez Obrador? I'm afraid that he's a little bit more radical and less moderate at the end of the day. And so they may hold sway. And that may align Mexico in the wrong axis in respect to the United States, to Europe, and to international cooperation. But that would be an incredible waste 
of a geopolitical opportunity to situate, to locate Mexico on a four axis type of position, looking to North America, to Latin America and serve as a bridge. And of course, looking to Europe and to Asia and sort of serve as an element that also negotiates some of these interests uh, to manage not just a more orderly uh, and, and, and well-controlled integration, economic integration and trade, especially now that Asia has uh, uh, signed the RCEP, the largest trade agreement ever conceived in the history of mankind uh, coming up. And I think Mexico is ideally located to serve as an incredible point of, of encounter but I don't think that is the, uh, the view that Lopez Obrador has in mind. He's a more insular autocrat mentality. And I think he will waste an incredible opportunity to lock arms with the Biden administration and truly project Mexico as an important uh, uh, aid in solving many of our global problems. And so that I think is the picture of the next four years. The big question hanging in the air is, will Mr. Lopez Obrador be able to make those changes that he needs to make uh, uh, to move Mexico into a different position than the one he currently is. I my doubts, but that is the question of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, for your remarks. I invite all the panelists to turn on, to turn on the, the video and the, and the microphone. Uh, I have a question for Ambassador Sarukan. Ambassador, as you mentioned in your yesterday's op-ed published in El Universal, the incoming Biden administration will face unprecedented challenges in a wide range of topics. The question is, do you think President Biden is the president that can bring the United States together and end the current polarization that is affecting the country? Uh. Not, not a lot to do with U.S.-Mexico relationship, but but obviously very important because of what happens in what happens in the U.S. isn't like Las Vegas. What happens in the U.S. does not stay in the U.S. It has a profound impact uh, for a country like Mexico. Uh, and and uh, look, I, I I am convinced, especially after having again seen and heard Biden speak yesterday, that this is the right man for the right time. Um, You saw it in his speech, the empathy, the simplicity, the down to earth, a man who is convinced of the importance of public service. If you saw the swearing in uh, ceremony that he headed for his staff that is already coming in at the White House when he said, um, if anyone insults, denigrates, uh, harasses uh, anyone on this team, I will immediately fire you uh, because we need decency That, 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 that is the man, if anyone can heal the profound divisions, the polarization, the tribalization of U.S. society prevalent right now, I think it's Joe Biden. Um, and, and it was also interesting to see that for a pol politician who's always been sort of a middle of the road, centrist, moderate politician, um, I, I think you're seeing a much more ambitious Uh, a public policy agenda, because I think, like, in many ways, and I think this explains why um, in, in these things that are pregnant with symbolism, uh, the portrait of Franklin Denner or Roosevelt uh, in, in the Oval Office in front of the Resolute Desk, I, I think that in many ways he understands that, like FDR, uh, taking uh, the helm of a country that was brutally broken by, by the economic recession and the social impact of that, that, that he has to think big to try and heal these profound divisions uh, that have, that have torn, away, torn away the social contract in, in, in the United States today. So definitely, I think he is the right man at the right time. Okay, thank you very much, Ambassador. Banda, there are a couple of questions about the Merida, uh, about the Merida initiative that you mentioned in your participation. And I think uh, they can resume it in, if you were in charge of rewriting the Merida initiative, what do you think should be its new pillars? Well, I think that the answers need to emerge uh, out of the dialogue, which has in fact been something that has been missing um, over the past two years, where uh, early on the Lopez Obrador administration indicated its dissatisfaction 
uh, with Merida Fair. That is obviously a right prerogative of any administration. But then when the US sought uh, uh, efforts to um, have a high level dialogue about what kind of adjustments uh, would be appropriate and mutually satisfying, um, there has been uh, little buy and little responsiveness uh, from the Lopez Obrador administration. So any kind of revisions cannot be unilateral uh, in the same way that uh, policy has been conducted, whether those are threats to designate um, Mexican uh, uh, organized crime groups as terrorist organizations, or whether it's something like the foreign agent law. But let me highlight some issues where I think uh, there would be some uh, productivity and some issues where um, uh, I don't think the revisions can go this way. Uh, Certainly, it doesn't appear to me that it, would be, that it would be at all possible and acceptable for the United States to uh, redesign uh, the cooperation as public health solely, particularly defined as treatment of those um, with uh, substance use disorder. That's a very important issue. Um, it's a fundamental issue, uh, but it's also an issue with limitations. Fentanyl is more like poisoning. Uh, the chance of overdose goes very rapidly. I would see real possibility for cooperation in something like ports, certainly in priority issues uh, such as cracking down on production of fentanyl in Mexico. Uh, but I would also hope that in order to um, uh, address some of Mexico's concerns about more unilateral action, uh, there would be opportunities to work on more special interdiction units, but this time with everyone being vetted and getting away from the old model where top Mexican officials in the units refused to be vetted. If everyone were vetted, both US and Mexican officials, I think there would be much more capacity to share intelligence and do uh, joint design planning. I would also hope that there could be thoughts about how to move beyond high value targeting or how to expand the interdiction package. Uh, so it doesn't solely rest on problematic uh, high value targeting, although it's not to say that uh, top criminals and top corrupt officials should get uh, away with it. Uh, I have other thoughts, but I'm mindful of time and want to have Enrique and Tony uh, opportunities to engage as well. Ambassador, do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I wanted to quickly add a couple of, of things to, to this important uh, list that, that Vanda has shared with us. The, the first one is that uh, both countries need to move away from the paradigm that has underpinned law enforcement collaboration and in particular the fight against organized crime by doing two things. One is moving away from the kingpin strategy, which despite the rhetoric uh, continues to drive policy in Mexico towards organized crime and to move towards a harm reduction, harm mitigation paradigm where you go against the more violent groups and you focus efforts on that. And then the second issue, which is something that is very hard to, to move the needle on because particularly in the US agencies love shiny toys and trinkets. They love helicopters and drones and go fast boats, but we need to put much more effort and much more resources and manpower into combating money laundering than going after interdiction and eradication. If, if we can get the money out of the system, that really helps to dislocate and break the backbone of how organized crime is able to purchase weapons, corrupt, uh, uh, hire sicarios, et cetera. And then the last comment, I, I, and I think it's, and I hope that what we've seen, the painful um, developments that we've seen in law enforcement collaboration, uh, which we need to understand not as the disease, but as the symptom. What has happened in the Cienfuegos case is a symptom of the breakdown of trust, collaboration, and more importantly, and this is where I want to go, the Media Initiative was more than just drugs and thugs. The Media Initiative was about processes, interagency processes, and coordination on both sides of the border. What Media Initiative did was ensure that there were air traffic controllers on either side of the border, ensuring that respective US or Mexican agencies coordinated among themselves and then coordinated with one another. When I mentioned Camarena, what Camarena inaugurated was an era of US agencies conducting their own particular, 
particular Mexican policies. Each agency had its own preferred uh, 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 interlocutors in Mexico. They ran their own separate, disparate um, policies. What many of that did, many of that was a straitjacket that forced everyone to go through one single system of collaboration, exchange, ensuring that we weren't duplicating resources and equipment. And as the Peña Nieto administration first, and then the López Obrador administration broke down many of that, and then Trump, who ignored the interagency process in the US, that's what has led to what we're seeing. So think of many of that beyond whether it's got 20 pillars, three pillars, four pillars, many of that was about processes. Okay, thank, thank you, Ambassador. There's a very interesting uh, question for you, Enrique, of something that you mentioned. That is, what is your opinion about the different roles that the Mexican military is assuming in Mexico? For example, the military is building an airport. It's in charge of the COVID vaccination campaign. Uh, it looks every day the military is assuming more roles that are out of its original scope. Do you think this can be a risk for Mexico's democracy? Well, this is a, a tremendous risk, I think, because indeed uh, the, the, the military are adopting more and more uh, functions that previously were in civil power. And um, they entail uh, money, they entail uh, strategic issues, such as the vaccination, as you mentioned. And, um, and that uh, certainly um, poses a big uh, threat to democracy in the sense that it's going to take a long, long time, if at all, you know, before we can get the, the military out of those functions. In other words, it, for, for me, it seems as if uh, the government is really making um, too close friends, so to speak, in terms of uh, uh, resources, economic resources, in terms of ongoing businesses, like the managing of the new airport of Santa Lucia, uh, the managing of the the Bank of uh, Welfare or the, the Bank of the Bienestar. Um, and so, and, and that I, I believe is um, um, potentially, it can be a tremendous um, problem for, for, uh, for democracy. Just imagine that something of the sort of the capital that we saw on, uh, on uh, January 6th in the US happened here uh, with uh, the the backing of the military, of the full backing of the military of the president, that that would be a different outcome altogether. So I, I, I believe that um, we have to be very watchful of what is happening, and uh, I'm very concerned about that indeed. Thank you, Enrique. Tony, there's a question for you. Uh, yesterday, President Biden signed an executive order that protects dreamers from deportation. Will you speak more about this executive order? Yeah, this is a, a this is a uh, a component of the agenda that, that is very very dear to to me because I've spent 20 years looking at the issue of immigration in the United States and in the binational relationship and uh, in the last eight and a half years at the Baker Institute uh, uh, pushing very aggressively as aggressively as I can for a, an immigration reform. Uh, we got close to it in 2013, 2014. Uh, it failed uh, mostly because at that time, John Boehner didn't present it before Congress. Uh, but I, I, um, I think that from even from the campaign, Biden was very clear about what he was gonna do. He was going to push for immigration. He was going to find a path to legalize the 10.7 million uh, um, undocumented residents in the United States, including the, the beneficiaries of DACA and TPS, and, uh, and of course, uh, uh, I think many of them uh, uh, during the pandemic showed, demonstrated that they are really important uh, parts of the economy uh, uh, in, in many strategic sectors. Many, many of them actually showed that they are essential workers in the United States and they deserve citizenship. I think France uh, rewarded many of them with citizenship. I think in the United States uh, that should be done. And fortunately, I think Biden has, has the Senate, control of the Senate, so it is entirely possible. Couple of things on that. I think it's a good idea. Uh, I don't think the United States has an immigration problem. That is a fallacy. The United States has not had an immigration program, pro problem since at least uh, 2007 when the number of undocumented immigrants and the number of apprehensions at the borders peaked. Um, 
And then it's been falling and falling and falling and falling all the way to today. Uh, the spikes that we've seen in the apprehensions are really people turning themselves in, asking for asylum, people trying to breach the border. It's actually minimal. And of course, in 2020, uh, uh, immigration was restricted uh, on many different fronts to the point that the United States, I think, uh, uh, has been at its lowest uh, point of uh, demographic growth, 0.35%, uh, the lowest in 120 years or so. Uh, it, it, and it is now considered an aging nation that will need to replenish itself with young people uh, who can contribute to the economy, to the um, ta tax base, and so on. So on the country, I think Biden has the potential to reconceive the immigration issue, to give it a new positive face, to resolve the huge piece that was a major block, which was the undocumented, and of course, to remove it as a... As a uh, as an opportunity for future populist politicians to use it politically to divide and polarize Americans. So this is a, this is a good news. It's a, it's a good opportunity you know, to do it, do it quickly, do it aggressively, do it extensively and take that off um, of the table. Now, on the other hand, watch Mr. Lopez Obrador get credit for immigration reform in the United States when he, on the contrary, fully cooperated with uh, Trump on immigration, not only by detaining immigrants on terrible conditions in Mexico, in, in facilities like Siglo XXI in Chiapas and other places, by deporting them summarily, by holding them for Trump at the border in Ciudad Juarez, for example, where I go teach and so on. And now he's gonna turn around and take credit and say that he's partly responsible. And I, I, I can tell you, I, uh, uh, you're going to see that he will try to take credit for it. He deserves none, none whatsoever, much like Trump. I think he was kind of cruel to immigrants and trans migrants through Mexico, perhaps necessarily so. But this is a good opportunity, good for Biden, that he's going to remove this block and move on. Thanks, Tony. Unfortunately, time is up. Uh, thanks to all of our panelists and to all of you that watch and listen this webinar. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Keep safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.